Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hey everybody, till the day is July 25th, 2018, and you're listening to our Human Factors Cast, Applied Human Factors and Ergonomic Society, or AHFE, 2018 bonus episode. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Logan Clark, who's live from Orlando. Just want to welcome all of our brand new listeners. And uh, if you're brand new to the show, welcome. We're glad to have you. We're going to do a lot of stuff on the show today. We're kind of going to talk about some general impressions from the com- uh, conference maybe compare and contrast it between other conferences and talk about a lot of the uh, of the actual talks that are coming out of the conference. Uh, we'll have all that to talk about and more right after this. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in human factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is Human Factors Etc., we're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. Okay, we're back. I'm here with Logan Clark. So, Logan, welcome back to the show. We haven't had you on since HFES 2017. I remember you came on to kind of talk about the uh, Toyota factory tour um, and a couple of things that you went to at HFES, but now you're back. You're here to talk about AHFE 2018. Uh, how are you? I'm doing great. It's good to be back. I'll tell you what, that um, that Human Factors cast intro, it's almost 100 episodes, but I'll tell you what, it gets me every time. <laughs> I, I remember a, we met up at uh, HFES and you told me, uh, I don't know if you might get embarrassed about this, but you told me every time it comes on, you kind of do a little dance in front of your girlfriend and she like, <laughs> yeah, and she, yeah she messes with me for being such a nerd, but man, it's takes me back to like the original, um, the original, original format way um, back like when. human factors of board games, human factors of Pokemon go, the old classics. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll be sure to, uh, talk about some of that in our hundredth episode, but, uh, so, so Orlando's treating you well. I, I just kind of want to jump right into this and kind of get your general impressions of the conference. What's it like over there at AHFE? So it's pretty nice. Uh, it's hard to choose a better setting for a conference. This might sound like a little bit of a tourism ad, but if you're trying to get people to come from around the country or around the world to a conference, it's a pretty solid strategy to just park it right next to a theme park. So the conference was at the Lowe's Royal, not Lowe's Royal Pacific, Rose Sapphire Falls, the the hotel right next to it. And it's about a couple stone throws away from all the Universal Parks. So as I was sitting there working at the front desk, checking people in uh, as a student volunteer, I'm looking over and I'm watching the Hulk firing off every couple minutes. Um, It was really an interesting setting for a conference because... You have people going and giving a presentation and then immediately walking out, going up to the room, changing, and then going out to the parks. That sounds like an awesome way to spend a day. Talk about the stuff that you love and then go, go uh, you know, get some adrenaline pumping through your system. So as I mentioned earlier, you were, um, so, so, well, I guess I kind of want to get more general impressions and maybe we can talk about this as we talk through the um, actual, uh, the, the, presentations you went to but what's kind of the attitude around on the floor like uh people having a good time is is there like a lot of good stuff coming out of there yeah definitely one of the things that really struck me especially um having been to hfes last year and having the the comparison is that it's a really it's a very heavily international conference um you see international on a conference name and it's it's pretty it's pretty solid it means you have people coming from around the world um, like I know HFES has a pretty active Australia chapter. They have the, that conference coming up. But this, from checking people in at the desk, just from my sort of informal headcount, it seemed that somewhere upwards of 75 or 80 percent of the presenters and attendees at this conference were from outside the U.S. So wow. 
it's definitely a very different feel as you're walking through the halls. You're hearing all these different languages being spoken. Um, also getting to hear English spoken with all these all these just wonderful accents. And um, also the networking is a little bit different, too, because you get to meet people who are working in similar areas. Like I get to work someone, um, meet someone who's working with EEG like I will be in grad school. Um, but working in the, on that same research somewhere completely different, um, whether it's in the UK or South Africa or the Middle East or Asia, it's just it's interesting to see this global community of human factors researchers sort of all in the same place talking about the same problems. That's really cool. And it's got to be sort of eye opening to know that, you know, sometimes here in the States, we kind of get tunnel vision and uh, we're very, you know, United States focused. But uh, I know for me, at least, doing this show and having a global audience uh, really has opened my eyes to there's there's efforts for human factors around the globe. Uh, and it sounds like, you know, it, it, these international conferences kind of offer you the same sort of perspective. Right. <laughs> Which is really cool. I, I think that's awesome. I, 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 I want to go to this thing. Oh, yeah. And I mean, even from the um, the student perspective, I was working behind the desk in order to get some free conference registration. Um, and also just to sort of get a behind the scenes view of how these types of these conferences sort of run. But there were there was one student that I worked with that was also from UCF and everyone, everyone else was from there was one student from Maine and then everyone else was from outside the U.S. So in between the lulls um, in registration, when people would be in their sessions, we'd get to talking about our research and our countries and had a couple great conversations over lunch comparing different aspects of U.S. culture with other with cultures from countries around the world. It was really cool. It was almost like a even though it was a human factors conference, it was also just a, a general a cultural mind broadening experience in and of itself. Yeah, well, that sounds that sounds really cool. All right. So I, I want to get into some of these presentations that you went to, because some of these look really cool uh, from the notes that you provided. Um, and just to let our listeners know, I think you said that you'd be willing to post up your full sort of notes that kind of expand further than the ones that we're going to talk about on the show tonight. You're going to post that in our Slack. Oh, definitely. Yes. Yeah. I went through my notes and um, grabbed the ones that were like sort of the most podcast worthy or kind of like the um, the ones that we th I thought might be most interesting to talk about within about an hour. But I had probably two or three times uh, this amount of notes that I put in. So I'm going to go ahead and throw that in the slack tonight after we're done recording and um, get that out to everybody so everyone can kind of indirectly experience what I just got to experience. That's excellent. Um, and uh, just kind of a caveat for our listeners, uh, this is Logan's kind of personal experience. Uh, if you go to AHFE, chances are you will experience something very different. And, you know, a lot of the stuff that we talk about on the show are taken from his notes. So there may be some little nuances here and there that may be missed. But uh, we, we will try to provide at least uh, the 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 stuff from the conference so that way you can go through and, and the papers so you can go through and, and see it yourself. Um, but let's, is there anything else you wanted to mention before we begin? No, I think that's a pretty good summary. All right. So let's go ahead and jump in. So the first one you have here is human factors and ergonomics and solving and coping with global problems. So let's, let's kind of walk through this. Um, I don't know how you want to tackle these. I just thought we'd maybe go through your notes and you can kind of give me a, just a overview of, of what these things are and and what the what the general idea was sure so this one was actually interesting because it was the keynote address so it was on the opening night i was actually here technically in a volunteer capacity but i managed to sort of pull the, the security detail checking people's badges as they came in so once the address started i was able to stand in the back and listen uh and frantically take notes on my phone to get as much down as i could so the idea of this talk and the, the speaker was a really compelling speaker. His name was Andrew Thatcher. He's the IO psychology chair at the University of Witwatersrand uh, in Johannesburg, South Africa. So this already just sort of kicks into gear the, the international nature of this conference. But sort of in keeping with the, the focus on human factors in the global community, he gave this talk on the idea that this general idea that we need to have a broad guiding philosophy for our research and for our applied work. So everybody sort of has their technical domain that they work in, the driving research, human automation interaction, physical ergonomics, or what have you. But his idea and his general idea of the talk was that we need to take this research and understand 
how we can directly bring value to the world through that research and look at that, the value of our work sort of in a, a global context. That's, so, so, yeah, we're already getting at the global stuff. We talked about how how uh, international this conference was, truly, and, and it, it seems like it kicked off with a bang already. Oh, definitely. So he, broke, he s sort of broke his presentation up into three parts, and I'll, I'll break them down really quickly. Uh, he started off with the state of the planet, which was kind of a – he said at the, at the start it would be a little bit um, – might be a little bit depressing, but it sort of puts things in perspective. Uh, he described how – and this was sort of a, a startling statistic for me, that if all humans live the same lifestyle as the average North American, uh, that there would be, need to be around three and a half Earths in order to sustain human life. So he builds off of that point with some other, some other information, but the general point of it is that a large portion of the world consumes a very small portion of its resources. And the big problem, especially from a human factors perspective, is that that part of the world, our part of the world, doesn't, when it's consuming those resources, it doesn't even in many cases know that it's consuming those resources. Um, so for example, he breaks, he puts up a pic, he put up a picture of a family sitting around a living room. Um, some of the kids are on their phones. Uh, the dad is like drinking a beer and it looks like they might be watching a football game or something. And he describes this sort of as like a standard scene in the US. And then he goes through and describes how the different com the energy that is powering the TV in one location is creating pollution in another location. Um, for example, how the key components in the smartphone that the kid is using were sourced from um, areas in the, Demo the Democratic Republic of the Congo, often with child labor because of some unfortunate circumstances that have played out there. So... With this, he presented this unique human factors problem of in these when we when we sort of live in these these bubbles where we're used to have consistently having access to all of these materials without necessarily understanding what goes into accessing them and the impact that accessing them has on other humans and the planet. Um, how do we create a more accurate mental model in ourselves and in others? Um, of the world. So for example, when I turn my thermostat down, instead of just seeing that the temperature is going down, I might see the amount of energy that I'm using. Um, or when I purchase a phone, for example, instead of just seeing the phone, how do we get people to see everything that went into that phone um, from both a human and uh, an environmental perspective? Yeah. These, so these part of that all... was with display design. Uh, part of that's with working with organizations. Um, so that was that was the general idea that he one of the um, general ideas that he got at. And then from there, it was um, he presented sort of a, a broad. Um, he called it the way forward, um, calling for human factors, researchers and practitioners to think actively about the value of our research um, for our societies and um, to move into a sort of a mode where instead of thinking uh, purely about individual systems, we think more about the complexity of those systems, how they all interact with each other, and then how those interactions can lead to sort of emergent features that have important impacts in the world. Yeah, I, this this is all really interesting to me because I, I know I've mentioned it on the, on the show a couple of times, but I used to be in an environmental psychology lab where uh, we were actually looking at reducing uh, electricity consumption in, here in the San Diego area. And, um, you know, a lot of decisions about what the interface was was all about the reduction of, of energy in the household and uh, what kind of impact that had, not only for the environment, but what factors helped them use less energy. And uh, but even that was pretty self-contained. It was like, yeah, here's your neighbors. That's what they're using. And then, um, you know, how does that affect your use? But what what this kind of talk, or at least it sounds like to me, is they're getting at how how does your energy consumption hurt the people in other parts of the world or you know how how do the products that you own and and consume how how what went into making those products and actually affecting other people in the world um and and yeah that's a really interesting design problem i mean uh, just having awareness isn't enough right we actually have to design for that type of thing and it's difficult when so many cultures are so sort of engrossed in the way that they do things that 
I, I'm speaking American culture here. Like I don't see a whole lot of people who are sitting down with their families watching a football game going, yeah, I am really, you know, sticking it to people across the world uh, by, by doing this. I, I don't like, I, and I don't see that changing. I don't see it even it's something they don't want to know. Um, so how do we elevate that and how do we show that this type of lifestyle is unsustainable, especially if we need what three and a half earths you said? Yeah, that was probably the most startling, one of the more startling statistics he presented. And he also looked at it, that's from the human context, but he also looked at it, um, from an environmental context and, um, talking about, I guess, what could what is kind of a, a little bit of a controversial subject in the U.S. politically, but the whole global warming um, discussion. He also broke into that and um, the impact that energy consumption has on on those types of variables. Yeah, I don't think it's too controversial for the audience that plugs into this kind of <laughs> show. Oh, I yeah. <laughs> I just don't know. I, I typically wanted I just kind of lean more toward the human element because I, you never know. It should it's not typically controversial among scientific audiences, but you never know. Yeah, I but yeah, I completely agree, though. It's it's uh, kind of eye opening sometimes to see these statistics and uh, really get sort of in that depression zone where you're just like, wow, what can we do? And it's, it's great because we, we always hear these climate scientists and, um, and like biology scientists, and and they're always talking about ways in which technology, just pure advances in, in the technological side from the technological side, how that can help reduce emissions in the environment. And when we think about, sort of reducing or or designing things in which you are informing the human to to stop the reduction that's a whole nother design problem and and to kind of get at that sustainability uh that's that's a whole that's a whole field of research and and it just needs to be incorporated ubiquitously across all all of our devices really to have any sort of major impact to it but you know marginal gains we'll get there hopefully i don't know yeah hopefully (laughs) That's the hope. <laughs> All right. On that depressing note, did you have any other thoughts on that one or did you want to move on to this next one here? Um, we can go ahead and move on. Uh, just one thing for any listeners who are interested. He did mention a paper that he's published kind of summarizing the, the talk. It's called um, The State of Science, Ergonomics and Global Change. So if any of the listeners are interested in that, they can definitely go and check out the paper. I know I'll definitely be going to give it a read at some point soon. Yeah, I will, too, after after this talk. Um, okay, so let's get into the second one here. This one is design of an enhanced disc golf game to facilitate players with visual impairments. As somebody with a visual impairment, although it's minor, I this is something that's near and dear to my heart. So why don't you go ahead and get into this one here? Okay, so this one was actually interesting because it was during a poster session. So I didn't actually get an opportunity, unfortunately, to talk with the author of this project. Um and I didn't have enough time to stick around because I was technically presenting a poster during this poster session, but I slipped away a little bit to go see what some of the other posters were. So the idea behind this and the rationale was that um, people who are who are completely blind or experience severe visual impairments typically have um, some challenges, and they um, in like the physical domain and being able to uh, they because they can't go out and play very easily play basketball or football or some of the other things that people will do with their friends to keep in shape. So there's sort of this, this drop off in, so in the social support and facilitation that people get from playing sports with their buddies. Um, and also in the physical activity and the value of the physical activity for health. So the idea that these researchers had, um, I'm just go ahead and give them a, a little bit of credit. It was, um, Casey Glatke was the, the, principal investigator along with a whole team of researchers from Arizona State University they had the idea of taking disc golf uh, which for those who listeners who aren't familiar it's basically just golf but with a frisbee and there's a instead of a hole it's a target with chains hanging above the ground it's kind of growing in popularity especially down here in Florida here Um, in San Diego too because it's because it's very easily accessible. It doesn't require a lot of equipment. You can go down and buy a disc golf disc for like five bucks and go out and just play with one disc. Uh, the courses are free. Typically, they, they're they in public parks that don't charge admission, so anyone can go out and play. So the idea that these researchers had was to take a sport like this that has a very 
very um, comfortable learning curve that's easy to pick up and fun to play and can also be played um, by all age groups uh, because it doesn't involve running or jumping or anything like that. Um, but it's a lot more accessible than golf. The idea that they had was to create a system using a combination of app of an app and a, a mobile app and Bluetooth sensors to make this game accessible for individuals with visual impairments. So what they did was they took a standard disc golf disc and they built a Bluetooth, a little mini, it looked like some sort of Bluetooth speaker into it. And they tested it uh, to make sure that the disc could be used without, with that speaker attached without having, causing any performance issues. And it, it still had all the same, effectively the same performance characteristics that it did before they attached the disc. Uh, before they attached the Bluetooth sensor. And then they created the system and they actually mapped out the workflow. I took a picture of the poster. It has the workflow, so we may be able to uh, link to that somehow. And they mapped out this workflow where when the participants want to start playing the game, they open the app and they can either tap, I guess, a button or have someone tap it for them to begin the game. And a Bluetooth, a little, one of these Bluetooth speakers will be placed at every tee and on every, atop every hole. So when they start the game, they'll hear they'll start to hear a little ping coming from the the first tee, and that will guide them toward the first tee. When they get there, the GPS mapping in the app knows that they're there. So the pinging at the tee stops, and the pinging then begins on the hole. So they can localize and figure out where the hole is, and then throw their disc in that direction. And then once they've thrown their disc, when their disc hits the ground, the hole stops pinging. And the disc begins to ping to guide them toward the disc so that they can then pick it up and throw it toward the hole again until they eventually um, get it in the hole. And then after that, when they pull their disc out of the hole, the next um, T will start pinging. So they have this, this great workflow that makes this game uh, that typically relies on a lot of, it's almost entirely visual, taking this game and making it purely auditory. I thought that was a really unique application. It really shows how good design can really open the world up to anybody. Yeah, and and uh, designing for accessibility often opens up avenues for those without any impairments as well, right? So, so people who are able to see could benefit from this as well because let's say, you know, you throw the disc or whatever and it gets stuck behind a bush or something, um, you'll, you'll be able to localize it and get to it. Uh, but this, this all sounds... Great. I, I don't get me wrong. This just sounds like a little complex to implement. I guess um, this th th there's a big complex system going on here where you have sort of uh, you know speakers that have to all hook up to each other, and then there's also the course, <coughs> right? So like the the unification through the app is is the great part. But I'm just wondering, like, I guess it's more technical than anything, but I, I'm just kind of amazed that they were able to get this to work in some capacity at all. So I wasn't able to tell from the poster if they had a full working uh, model. They did. They tested out a model of the like a prototype of a disc that has one of these implanted into it. That has one of these little uh, mini Bluetooth sensors implanted into it. But I'm not entirely sure. It wasn't clear from the poster if they had worked out an entire course that was able to work this way, or if they had, um, or if they had just designed and laid out the workflow. Um, it may have also been possible that I misinterpret, I slightly misinterpreted the poster because uh, unfortunately the researcher wasn't there, so I didn't get a chance to talk with them. Uh, so as I've been thinking about it, it is possible that they, that the Bluetooth device that's implanted into the um, implanted into the disc actually just communicates with the phone and the phone may have some sort of frequency of the beep kind of like as you as you move closer the the beep will speed up and that sort of indicator um, may have been used through the app to maybe decrease some of the complexity but mm -hmm. again I'm not I'm not entirely sure because I didn't get a chance to chat with them so uh, Arizona State research team if you're listening my LinkedIn is in the show is in the um, show description yeah get back at him uh, or join us in the Slack and, and get to everybody. Oh, I should mention that for our new users. We do have a Slack channel where we can uh, talk about all this interesting stuff and more. Uh, lots of discussion with people 
from a wide range of experience. Talk about people who are just students getting into the field or people who have been doing this for 30 years. So uh, feel free to join us on our Slack. Okay, do you have any other closing thoughts on this one? I think it's a really cool novel idea and a great application for um, taking a, a, a multimodal game and making it completely auditory. I think that's awesome. Oh, definitely, yeah. I think we're ready to slide into the next one. Cool. All right, so this next one is user-centered design for unmanned <clears throat> systems in a dynamic environment. Uh, and this is for naval surface vessels, so I'm, I'm pretty interested in this. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and go over this? Sure. So this was really unique in part because when I first saw the title in the um, in the poster session description, it was a little when I when I saw the title, it was like, OK, unmanned systems in a dynamic environment. Like that's a little vague. But when I got to the poster and I actually did get a chance, thankfully, to talk with the researcher uh, who's heading up this project. His name's Dr. Uh, Dr. Glenn Osga. He works for a um, consulting firm out somewhere on the West Coast. I didn't exactly get the name. I didn't. Um, get the name down of this company. But he's working to wireframe the user interface for the eventual naval version of drones. So we already have unmanned aerial vehicles, we have unmanned ground vehicles, and apparently we also have unmanned submersibles that are either deployed or in development. I had never heard of those before. But apparently the Navy at some point is going to be looking at, toward developing some sort of unmanned surface vehicle that um, will have all that he has right now is some very um, all that they've publicly released right now are these very general specs that this uh, it'll be like sort of a mid-sized um, to small vehicle they know that a helicopter will be la able to land on the back of it uh, that it can go high speeds over medium distance or medium speed over long distance and some of these other characteristics uh, but with these these basic characteristics, uh, he's his group has sort of been tasked with wireframing a user interface that uh, a dr sort of a drone operator, except in the context of this system, would potentially be using to perform all of the tasks that this ship needs to perform. So everything from mission planning uh, to navigation to replanning missions when something goes wrong, delivering payloads. Uh, everything. So it, it was really interesting to see the, the breakdown because when you lo typically look at UI design, the from at least from my understanding as a as a student from what I've read, there seems to be this process where you will look at you'll sort of wireframe an interface, like think, okay, these are the tasks we need to do. Let's do some sort of task analysis, get a workflow together, then put together an interface that might work uh, to help us accomplish these tasks. Then put it in the hands of users, see what they like, see what they don't like, see what works. Uh, alter it and then prototype some more. What I thought was really unique about this, aside from the fact that it's just a really, a really cool, uh, objectively cool application, is that he's doing user interface design and creating these these wireframe interfaces without any users, without any subject matter experts, and without the system even existing yet. So he had to put together some pretty interesting. Um, protocols in order to do this he actually went uh, with his team and observed human um human naval operators performing the key tasks of piloting vessels and he used that information to put together uh workflows for each of the tasks then they built individual interfaces individual wireframe interfaces that could be used to accomplish all of those tasks and then they took from that the most commonly used uh, features across all of the tasks, made those the most prominent in the full interface, and then had the others that were very task-specific toggle on and off. So even though the when the system eventually comes out, the workflow might change and the interface needs might change, uh, before the system even comes out, uh, before the, the ships are even fully built, developed, or released, uh, Human Factors is already out of the gate, which I, I found really interesting because one of the complaints people can typically uh, have is that human factors gets brought in too late or it's not quite as involved in the design cycle as uh, we, we may want it to be. So to see human factors sort of anticipating uh, and getting out ahead of new technologies and having interfaces ready to go uh, as soon as they're, they're finally built is pretty exciting. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, this gets a little close to the work that I work on and... Um... You know, I don't really talk about that stuff on the show due to oh, of course 
you know, just security risks. And, and honestly, um, it just, it opens up discussion that I don't know necessarily if we want to open up that bag, bag of worms, but I'm glad that there are people out there presenting on this type of stuff, and I'm glad that you found it interesting. So at this time, I'll decline to comment on it. <laughs> but that's not that's not for lack of uh, lack of interest. It's just because of uh, you know some some conflict of interest, maybe if you will. I just I don't I I don't want to uh, deter any of our listeners from going and looking this up. This is all really interesting stuff, and you're absolutely right. I can offer a couple tidbits, and that yes, we are kind of getting ahead of that curve now. I think. Um, you know, there are champions out there who are trying to get human factors uh, incorporated early on, especially in defense projects. Um, people are lobbying on the Hill to get human factors involved, even at the requirements process is w- way, way to the left of anything being actually developed. Right. And so the best we can do is to try to get as involved as early as we can and get as much information as about the the potential users that will be doing these things um i'm trying to leave it vague here oh certainly (laughs) the the potential users who will do these things in the future right get as much information as you can and then use that to inform design um it's the, the yeah there's a lot of champions and and um it's happening so that's all i can say Oh, definitely. Yeah, we don't want to. We don't want to have any national security breaches here on Human Factors Cast. No. That would definitely not be good. There certainly won't be. All right. So with that, I'm gonna head, have us jump into the next one here. All right. Uh, sure. So the next one. Uh, this is one of my. Uh, I guess all of these are my favorites from the the conference. But this next one is called "Seeing and Feeling: Insights from a UI Case Study." Uh, it's from Nam Nguyen. Uh, from the U.S., I wasn't able to get a hold of his university affiliation at the time, um, but this was a really unique UI case study, and it kind of encapsulates a lot of the. Um, I went to a lot of UI and UX talks while I was here, while I was at the conference. It was uh, UI and UX and uh, physiological sensing were my two big focus areas, and there were at least three or four. Um, of the talks that employed this type of general approach. So I just grabbed on, grabbed hold of the best one to um, what I thought was the best one, at least to bring here. So the idea behind this particular approach is in using um, in doing UX evaluation, at least from, from my understanding and from what he's described here, there's typically the, the approach of, Uh, Working with users and having this, like what we just mentioned, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't. Um, And sometimes that's survey measures, sometimes that's behavioral measures, uh, looking at their workload or looking at at the parts of the interface they like, parts they dislike, how you can make the workflow uh, smoother and more effective. But what they did here was integrate a bunch, a bunch is actually probably the best way to describe it, of physiological measures. along with those behavioral measures to be able to get an objective look of what's working well in the interface and what wasn't. So for this particular topic, they broke down um, the air, the websites of three different airlines. So they mentioned the airlines. I guess we won't mention them here because I don't want to, um, I don't want to bad mouth any individual airlines <laughs> or anything. Um, but they had users work and perform particular uh, specific tasks on these different air on the websites for these three different airlines so for example one of the tasks was finding their bag fee do they charge for bags if so how much one of them was booking a flight i believe from boston to la so they had them perform these tasks and they're able to get the typical behavioral measures like for example how long it takes them to perform a task how long it takes them to locate and click on like the optimal button that they need to find in order to um, get on the optimal path to the task. But at the same time, they also have them hooked up to eye tracking. They have them hooked up to... Um, all right, so the, they have eye tracking going. They have a facial expression analysis, which I had never heard of before. Um, they have EEG, and they also have uh, electrodermal activity, so a galvanic skin response, which is sort of a, mm-hmm. an index of stress. So they only they didn't report any of their EEG results, which was a little bit unfortunate for me because I was really excited to, to hear some of those, but they'll be getting into those eventually. 
But what they were able to do is look objectively at when subjects were experiencing distress or discomfort or when they were disliking any particular point in the process. So, for example, when they look at the data, they can see that at 2 minutes and 32 seconds into the process, the subject's brow furrows and at the same time, his uh, galvanic skin response measure goes up. So he's he's getting a, he's either a little bit stressed or he's 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 not happy with what's going on. And from that, they can take that time locking point and they can go to the eye tracking measures that they were recording simultaneously with that. And they can say, OK, where was he looking when this started? Where were his eyes gazing? What was the path that his eyes were following during this time when he was experiencing this stress or this discomfort? And then they can also look at where he was in the task flow at that point. And when they do that with enough participants, then they have the opportunity to say this, to objectively say, these are the sticking points in the interface that we need to work on and that we need to evaluate. Sure. Yeah, this is, okay, so I'm of two minds on this. Uh, this is something that, well, I'm trying to lay out all my thoughts here. One, I can't believe this hasn't been done before. <coughs> and um, that's, that's really interesting to me. I bet you they, the, all these... I bet you some degree of this has been done before, like maybe one of the variables such as facial expression with the typical human performance metrics, but or maybe them all in isolation, but not necessarily combined together. And the combination of these is really interesting to me because, um, you know, I'm I'm one person who values data tremendously. I, I think the more data you have, the more you can get at. But I also think there's a danger in that because... Um, you have to know where to look. Fortunately, with a lot of these measures, it's fairly obvious when the participant has experienced some sort of stress or um, some sort of response to the stimuli. And uh, so, so that's that's side one. Side two, I'm looking at this from a practical perspective, right? Like this, I, what kind of things would this be interested in? Well, perhaps. Uh, situations where there is high stress environments and you're evaluating some sort of UI, right? Like if there's task-based things that you have to do, like operating a, a lot of UAVs or um, unmanned naval warships, right? If you're operating a bunch of those and you're under a lot of pressure, I can see where at least doing some initial testing using all these in combination uh, would be useful. But then back on the other side, uh, you have to have the equipment in place, and I don't know if a lot of places are going to be uh, or, or, or are able to see the return on investment for um, purchasing this type of equipment, right? Some of these are highly specialized <coughs> and, and fairly expensive, especially for uh, maybe maybe startups or something that don't have necessarily a whole lot of funds. So I'm of two minds. I think this is great, honestly. I, I love the combination of... Um, data but at the same time i'm looking at it from the practical sp perspective and and don't really see this taking off um but who knows maybe as this technology becomes more cheaper and and uh less invasive i guess um because if you're sitting there with you know eegs and stuff on, or gsrs on your fingers and eegs on your head and everything it, it can be fairly um unnatural for the participants Oh, definitely. Actually, one of the things that they were discussing in this um, this session, because they, they were also it was it was a research presentation, but it was also sort of a um, it was also a little bit of a sort of a marketing spiel about the the technology, the the software. Uh, don't obviously don't want to buzz market, but it was the um, the about the software that allows them to integrate all of these measures. Um, and a part of the reason that they originally developed the software is because some of the measures, like eye tracking, for example. Um, are becoming a lot cheaper. So especially with eye tracking, uh, they, they sort of emphasize that even though you uh, really high fidelity, like a, a, something that can record eye movement to like a thousand hertz or something like that, um, those research quality ones are still relatively expensive, but there are very simple um, portable models that you can just hook up to a laptop that record maybe at 25 or 50 hertz but it's still good enough for practical design um, for applied uses when you're not trying to look specifically sure. at the millisecond to millisecond movement of the eyes. But especially for EEG, I definitely agree with you that those systems are still pretty expensive. So I guess we'll have to see how this plays out if those 
if someone's able to do with EEG what other people have done with Ethnir. Yeah, I mean, honestly, some of the expense, you bring up eye tracking, and yes, yeah, I mean, you could do it with a laptop uh, camera now, um, just looking at sort of the, the amount of white in the eye, right? Uh, and the reflection on the screen. But, but I think the expensive part of that is the software. If you can offer licenses that are fairly um, inexpensive for researchers or even, um, you know, companies who are performing user research, I think that could be uh, valuable. But, yeah, the, the getting back to the, uh, the invasiveness of, of some of these measures, I think, I think that's what's really holding it back. Um, but yeah, who knows? I mean, we're, we're putting fitness bands on, on rings now, so it'll just get smaller and smaller and who knows what we'll get in the future. Definitely. And speaking of low cost software, that actually brings us directly into our next, uh, present, our next presentation. If we want to get into that. Hey, look at that. Yeah, let's do it. All right. So this last one is a uh, group eye tracking paradigm for in investigating interaction under social context. That's a mouthful. Why don't you break it down? <laughs> Yeah, so this was, um, even though the individual studies that he uh, presented were just sort of validation studies to show that this technology can work and that it can be used in particular uh, paradigms, the technology was what was really fascinating about this, um, this presentation. So this researcher um, in Turkey, his name is, uh, oh, I'm going to butcher this, uh, Sen Sengiz Akarturk, uh, Dr. Akarturk, if I just butchered your name and you're listening, I'm sorry. Um, he is developing this software that allows eye trackers, uh, multiple eye trackers, uh, to communicate with each other so that you could have, say, I could be sitting here at a computer. Nick, you could be sitting in a, a workstation next to me. Blake could be sitting further down. And the three of us could all be working on a single, uh, single task. And I would see on my screen, I'd be able to see my the movement of my eyes, or I might not be able to see the movement of my eyes, but on my screen, I'd be able to see the movement of your eyes and Blake's eyes. On your screen, you'd be able to see both of our eye movements and so forth. So it allows this technology, there's so many potential applications for this in team performance research, um, shared mental models, efficiency in teams, things like that, um, and also just general research into social interactions. But the big the big thing that he broke down with this is that, um, A, he, once the, the software for connecting these eye trackers is completed, he's going to make it open source so that anyone can access it for free oh, that's um, and begin working with it. Um, and also, right now, he has it set up so that it can connect up to nine eye trackers. So if you have, a for researchers who are working with large teams or sort of teams in operational environments, uh, maybe in anything from intelligence gathering to business, um, they'd be able to, to potentially study how these um, how these people interact and how having access to the gaze information of other individuals might impact their performance if they're working together on a task. Uh, or also some of the other scenarios that he broke down are when people are competing on a task. How does that impact um, when they can see where others are looking, what others are doing? How does that impact their behavior? So definitely it's a more of a, a promising sort of a food for thought thing. Um, a little, a little, a little nugget to think about and potentially apply to future research. Yeah, I mean the last, the last thing we talked about with all the uh, data gathering methods was about blasting it with a bunch of different methodology, and this one's kind of unifying a single technology to look at uh, a, a group of individuals. And I, I just, I love where all this stuff is going. I love the fact that we are trying to combine all these different methods to get new, novel, interesting ways of looking at information and human performance, and it can only go up from here. I'm, I'm really excited about all of it. It is really exciting, and it's also great to see that there's this trend, especially in applied environments, but also in just in research in general, um, sort of moving toward the the more physiological measures. Even though I've had I had a really informative discussion with some other grad students on this, um, but there's a even though there are physiological methods and physiological measures present their own issues and their own confounds and their own ambiguities, uh, it's still nice to be able to apply something that's a little bit more objective and a little easier to to quantify and to study and to rule out alternative explanations. Uh, than you can also often get with surveys and behavioral measures. So it's definitely a promising place that we're heading, I think. 
I think so too. All right, Logan. Well, it's about a time for us to wrap this up. Do you have any other closing thoughts on AHFE 2018? Oh, no, that pretty much covers it. I definitely uh, encourage anyone who's uh, been to HFES and enjoyed it, or just anyone in general who's interested in human factors. If you haven't attended AHFE, it's definitely worth a shot. It has a little bit more of an applied bent, and you also have the focus of the international human factors community. So it's a, it's a unique experience in and of itself. So it's nice to, um, nice to be able to branch out a little bit and experience some, some new and unique research from around the world. All right. Well, I think that is just about going to wrap it up for today. That's it for our coverage of Applied Human Factors and Ergonomics Conference 2018. If you're brand new to the show, like I said, welcome uh, for the rest of you and new people, too. Uh, You can join the discussion on our Slack or follow us all over social media. We're on LinkedIn, Facebook or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. Drop us a a comment on our SoundCloud. Send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. Please let us know if you guys saw anything interesting coming out of AHFE. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, like Logan said, he's going to drop some of those uh, links to the show notes in our Slack. So join us there. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. Uh, And, of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web at humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank Mr. Logan Clark for hanging out with me and breaking down AHFE 2018. Where can our listeners find you if they want to talk about anything coming out of that conference? Uh, They can find me on LinkedIn at Logan Clark D or on Twitter at Big Pugin Clark. Great. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again, guys, for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, Logan? It depends. It depends. It depends.